Hi class, uh, in this video I want to do an introduction to all the different rules for calculating probability. Uh, this is quite a lengthy lecture and I'm going to go through examples of all the rule or I'm going to talk about all the rules and provide examples of each. All right, so we'll start with some of the, uh, we'll start with the easiest rules uh, for probability and then work our way forward. So we'll start with what's called the addition rule and complement. Okay, so our objectives for this section are three. We want to use the addition rule for what we call disjoint events. And I'll explain what disjoint events are in a bit. We want to use the general addition rule. That's the second thing. And then we want to compute the probability event using what we call the complement. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so let's start with that first objective, using the addition rule for disjoint events. All right, so first off, what are disjoint events? Two events are disjoint if they have no outcomes in common. All right, another name for a disjoint event is mutually exclusive, all right, meaning they can't happen at the same time. So like uh, disjoint events are if you flip a coin, one event is um, getting heads, another event is getting tails. Obviously, they're disjoint because you can't flip a coin and get both heads and tails at the same time. All right, we often draw pictures using what we call Venn diagrams. All right, these pictures represent events as circles, like this circle represents one event, this other circle represents another event, all right, uh, enclosed in a rectangle, all right? And what the rectangle represents is the sample space. Well, we know the sample space is the list of all outcomes or all the possible outcomes, and each circle represents a specific event within the sample space. For example, suppose we have randomly selected chip from a bag where each chip is labeled with the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way to 9. So there's 10 possible things. If we let E represent the event, choose a number less than or equal to two, well, there's three ways that can happen, zero, one, two. And if we let F represent the event, choose a number greater than eight, greater than or equal to eight, well, that's eight or nine, then this circle F, all right, represents that event. So as you can see, these events are disjoint because the two circles don't overlap. They cannot happen at the same time. All right, so let's compute some probabilities real quick. If I say, what's the probability of event E? Well, that's the number of ways E can occur divided by the number of things in the sample space. Well, there's three ways that it can occur divided by 10. That's just 0 0.3. All right, the probability of event F, same idea. There's two ways F can occur divided by 10. That probability is just 0 0.2. Now, if I say, what's the probability that E or F happens? So this will be a little preview here. Whenever you see or, you're going to want to think multi, or excuse me, addition, All right? So the number of ways that E or F could happen, well, it looks like E or F would be one, two, three, four, five ways divided by ten, and that equals zero point five. All right, so kind of seeing it this way, when I said think of it as addition, you take the probability of event E plus the probability of event F, you get zero point three plus zero point two. That's how you also get that zero point five. All right, so the basic rule for this, if you know the two events are disjoint, so if events E and F are disjoint or mutually exclusive, meaning they cannot happen at the same time, then if I ever write what's the probability of E or F happening, well, that's just equal to the probability of the first event E plus probability of the second event F. Very simple formula to remember. <clears throat> so the addition rule for disjoint events can be extant, expanded to two or more disjoint events. So in general, if events E, F, G, dot, 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 how many ever there are, each have no outcomes in common, right? So they're pairwise disjoint, meaning E has nothing in common with F, E has nothing in common with G, F has nothing in common with G, and so on. Then if I say, hey, what's the probability of E or F or G happening? Well, if they're all disjoint, then you just sum the probability of E plus probability of F plus probability of G, and so on. All right, so let's work a problem from a table. So the probability model to the right shows the distribution of the number of rooms and housing units in the United States. All right, so for example, the probability that uh, a housing unit um, has um, one room in it is 0 0.01. Probability it has two rooms is 0 0.03, and so on. Okay. So the first thing is verify that this is a probability model. Well, the way you'd verify that is um, two things. One, all the probabilities are between zero and one, so there's no probability greater than one, no negative probabilities. And the second thing is if you sum up all these individual probabilities, this plus this plus this and so on, it equals one. 
right? So this table is a um, probability model. That's great. All right, so the next question, what is the probability a randomly selected housing unit has two or three rooms? All right, well, this, this event is disjoint, right? The two events here are disjoint because you can't have a housing unit that has both two and three rooms. Like it either has two rooms and it either has three rooms. Like it can't have both at the same time. Or it can't have the same classification at the same time. So the probability of two or three rooms, well, that's just equal since they're disjoint to the probability of two rooms plus the probability of three rooms. So you would simply just add these two probabilities right here. And that probability is equal to 0 0.125. As a follow-up, what is the probability that random selection unit has one or two or three rooms? So this plus this plus this, this or this or this. So probability of one or two or three, well, since they're all disjoint, because you can't have the same classification at the same time, you just sum those three probabilities up and you would just get 0 0.135 for this problem. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, let's go to the second objective. Let's now use the general addition. So what happens basically when you have a case when the events are not disjoint or they can happen at the same time? So for any two events, E and F, if I say, what's the probability of E or F happening, right? If they are not disjoint, so they can happen at the same time, then it must be the probability of E plus the probability of F. And then you have to subtract away the probability that E and F happens, right? This, this subtraction here prevents you from double counting it, right? So if they happen at the same time, it prevents you from double counting. All right, let's do an example. All right, so what I have here actually is a casino game example. It's the casino game of craps, basically, right? So in craps, what you do is you, you roll two dice, right? And then whatever two numbers show up, you sum them, okay? So for example, if you roll two dice and you get one, one, you add those together, that would sum to two. If you roll two dice and you get three, three, you would sum those together, three plus three and get six. All right, so let's, um, let's define two events. Let's let E equal the first dice is a two. So you can see that this row here is the first dice is a two. And let's let F be the sum of the dice is less than or equal to five. Well, if this is the row where the first dice is a two, because here's a two, here's a two, two, two in the first one, you can see that these two events can happen at the same time. Like I can roll the first dice being a two, and then the sum being less than or equal to five, because two plus one is three, two plus two is four, Two plus three is five, right? So, so these events are not just disjoint; they can happen at the same time. All right. So the probability of the first event. All right. So the probability of rolling uh, the first dice is a two. Well, it looks like there's one, two, three, four, five, six outcomes here. There's 36 total. So the probability that the first dice is a two is one out of six. The probability that the um, uh, sum is less than five. Well, I'll let you go back and look in here. The number of dice, uh, the number of ways you can roll and the sum be less than five is 10. So 10 divided by 36 uh, reduces to five over 18. So now the number of ways, right, that you can roll um, the first number being a two and some less than five, it's less than or equal to five. If you go back here, it's one, two, three ways right here. So three out of 36, the probability is 112. So then the probability that E or F happens here, well, since they can happen at the same time, this is the number of ways, 112, or probability 112, that they um, uh, happen at the same time. So you would take the probability of E plus the probability of F. Now, if you didn't do that, if you just went six plus 10 here, uh, six over 36 plus 10 over 36, what you would be doing I'm going to go back again, is you'd be double counting this, these three dice rolls twice. So then you have to subtract away the probability of E and F, and the true probability that you would roll the first dice is a two, or the sum is less than or equal to five, would be 13 out of 36. All right, so just when you go to do these problems, whenever there's an or, you should always ask yourself, is there a situation where these two events can happen um, together or happen at the same time? If so, then I have to make sure I don't double count and I subtract away the probability of E and F. 
All right, let's do the third objective. So let's compute the probability of an event using the complement rule. So you've all used the complement rule before in your life and you probably haven't realized it. Like for example, if I say, hey, the probability that somebody watched the Super Bowl is, is uh, 60%, all right, what's probably somebody did not watch the Super Bowl? Well, you probably just went in your head, well, it's gotta be 40%. That, that's basically what the complement rule is. All right, so definition. Let S denote the sample space of a probability experiment and let E denote any event, doesn't matter. The complement of E, right, which we denote as E with the superscript C, is the outcome in the sample space that are not in the outcomes of the first event. So think of it as the complement is everything else that could happen. So if E represents any event and EC represents the complement of E, then the probability that the opposite or everything else could happen. So the probability of the complement is equal to one minus the probability of the original event. So if you look about it like this, this right here is event E. This is the total sample space. Okay, so this rectangle is the entire region. EC here represents everything that's not in E, right? So the area outside the circle represents the complement. So everything else that could happen. All right, so let's work an example. So according to the American uh, Veterinary Medical Association, 31.6% of American households own a dog. Oh, that's nice. So what is the probability that a randomly selected household does not own a dog? Well, the probability that you do not own a dog, the opposite of not owning a dog is you own a dog, right? So we know the probability that somebody owns a dog, it's right here. So this is just one minus, changing that to a decimal, one minus 0 0.316. So the probability that a household does not own a dog is 0 0.684. <clears throat> so this is a pretty intuitive um, rule, but it's gonna be very useful when we get to the end of this lecture and we start working some of the harder problems. All right, let's work um, an example um, from a table. So the data to the right represents the travel time to work for residents in this in Hartford, Connecticut. Okay, so what this is is your commute time. So we basically talked to people in Hartford and found out that how long it took them to get to work. So for example, roughly 24,000 people had to commute less than five minutes. Must be nice. So 8,000 people roughly had to commute between 40 and 44 minutes. So what is the probability that a randomly selected resident has a travel time of 90 or more minutes? Okay, well, I have here the frequencies, All right? So what you'd first have to do is find the total number of residents in Hartford, Connecticut. So if you sum up all these, there's 318,800 residents in Hartford, Connecticut. So the probability that a randomly selected resident will have a commute time of 90 or more minutes well, that's just the number of people who have commute times of 90 or more minutes divided by the total. So it's really just 0 0.015, very small probability. All right, so compute the probabilities that a randomly selected resident of Hartford, Connecticut will have a commute time of less than 90 minutes. So I wanna use this using the complement rule. All right, so the probability that somebody has a commute time less than 90 minutes using the complement rule is one minus the opposite. So one minus the opposite of having a commute time less than 90 minutes is having a commute time of 90 minutes or more. So this is just one minus the probability of a commute time of 90 minutes or more. Well, we computed that in the previous example. So that's just one minus 0 0.015 or 0 0.985. You'd get the same thing if you went and summed all these numbers here all these first, all these columns here and divided by this. But using the complement rule, which is, you know, a lot easier in this case. So we use the complement rule, as you can see, when it's easier, when I ask you a really hard probability and it's easier to find the opposite half. That's basically what we're doing here. All right, let's move on to um, a more advanced rule, all right? So this is something called independence in the multiplication rule. So in the, the last thing we'll end on actually is when we have dependence in the multiplication. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> okay, so objectives here. We want to in, identify independent events. We want to use the multiplication rule for independence events. And then the last thing we want to do 
is something that's pretty hard. It's compute at least probabilities. So let's do the first one, identify independent events. So two events, E and F, are independence if the occurrence of event E, right, the occurrence of the first event in a probability experiment does not affect the probability of the second event F, right? Two events are dependent if the occurrence of the first event E in a probability experiment affects or, or alters the probability of the second event F. All right, so independent if what happens first doesn't affect what happens second, dependent if what happens first does affect what happens second. All right, so let me give you some examples here if they're independent or not. All right, suppose you draw a card from a standard 52 card deck, right, of cards and then roll a dice. If the first event is draw a heart and the second event is roll an even number, these are independent because, you know, if you draw a heart from a deck, it will not change or alter the probability that you then roll an even number. So the results of choosing a card do not impact the results of a die roll. Obvious. Independent. Next, suppose two 40-year-old women who live in the United States are randomly selected, right? The events, the first woman survives the year and the second event is the second woman survives the year are independent because the first woman surviving the year has no impact on if the second person that I randomly select survives the year. Meaning like if I sample someone in California, the probability that that woman survives the year won't affect the probability that say a second woman in like Colorado survives the year. So they're independent. Next, suppose two 40-year-old women live in the same apartment complex. Okay, so now it's a very small sample size. The events, the woman one survives a year and woman two survives a year, they're dependent actually. Because when I sample the first woman from an apartment complex, it will change the probability because there's so few people that I randomly select another woman who survives that year from the same complex. So when you sample from small sample sizes without replacement, that's dependent. Okay, so small sample sizes without replacement are dependent events. All right, so let's use the multiplication rule for independent events. So the general multiplication rule when you have two events, E and F, if they're independent and I say, hey, what's the probability that event E and event F happens? Well, that's just equal to the probability of the first event, E, and you just literally multiply it by the probability of the second event, F. So as I said, when you see the probability of E or F happening, you think addition. When you see the probability of E and F, you think multiplication. All right, so let's work a uh, problem. The probability that a randomly selected female age 60 years old will survive the year. So if someone who's um, a female, then they're 60, the probability to make it to 61 is 99.186. This is according to the National Vital Statistics Report. So what is the probability that two randomly selected 60-year-old females will survive the year? Well, the survival of the first female is independent of the survival of the second, okay? Because if they're just randomly selected from everybody in the United States, there's no way the survival of one will have an impact on the survival of the second. So we also know the probability that a 60-year-old female survives is 0 0.99186. All right, so here using our, our rule. So I want to find the probability that both survive. So the way I would write it is, I want to find the probability the first survives and what needs to happen if I want them both survive is the second survives. So this is equal to then, since they're independent and I see the and statement in there, is the probability the first survives times the probability the second survives. Well, I know the probability that an individual person will survive, right? It's 0.99186. So it's literally just 0.99186 times 0.99186, which is equal to 0 0.9838. Very simply like that. Let's do another one. A manufacturer of exercise equipment knows that 10% of the products are defective. They also know that only 30% of their customers will actually use the equipment in the first year it is purchased. All right. If there is a one-year warranty on the equipment, what is the proportion of customers will actually make a valid claim? All right, this is a little weirded word. So here's what has to happen. All right, if we want to find the probability that they make an, act, an, an actual claim, a couple of things need to happen. They need to get a piece of equipment that is defective, and then they need to make a claim. All right, so I want to find, so we, what we're going to assume that is that the defectiveness of the equipment is independent of the use of the equipment. Like if 
you get shipped uh, uh, defective equipment, it won't have any bearing if you actually use it or not. All right, because that's that's the only way you'll know if you're going to need your warranty. So what I want to find is the probability that it's defective and used. That's the only way. If you use it, that's the only way you'll find out that it's defective. So they're independent. So it's going to be the probability of defective and used. I see the and statement. So that tells me to multiply. So it's the probability that it's defective times the probability it's used. Well, I know the probability it's a defective. It's 0 0.10 times the probability that someone actually uses it in the first year is 0 0.30. So that's just equal to this times this gives you 0 0.03 or 3%. So really, really low. All right. So the general multiplication rule for n independent. So this that was only two. So if you have how many ever events, E1, E2, E3, all the way to En, it could be four events. It could be 500 events, right? If they're all independent, so if the, they all don't affect the probability of each other, then I ask you, what's the probability of E and E1 and E2 and E3 and so on? Well, whenever you see the and, it's just multiplication. You just literally multiply all the events together. So let's go back to this one. All right, the probability of the randomly selected female age 60 years old will survive the year is again 99.186. Right? What is the probability now that four randomly selected 60-year-old females will survive the year? All right, so not two, but four. All right, so I want to find the probability that all four survive the year. Well, the way I would write this, if I want all four to survive, the first needs to survive, and the second needs to survive, and the third needs to survive, and the fourth needs to survive. Well, they're all independent here, all right, because if the first one survives, we'll have no bearing on if any of the others survive, and so on. So when I see the and statement, it just implies multiplication. So it's probably the first survives, times probably the second survives, probably the third survives, times probably the fourth survives. This is just, we know the probability that they survive, 0.99186. So this times this times this times this, or another way to think about this, it's really just 0 0.99186 to the fourth power. That's just equal to 0 0.9678. So still pretty high odds. All right, let's expand on this in that problem and try a really harder one, right? A much harder one. I mean. So I want to compute what are called at least probabilities. All right, so the probability that a randomly selected female age 60 years old will survive the year is 99.186. All right, we know that. We've been working that a bunch. What is the probability at least one of 500 randomly selected 60-year-old females will die during the course of the year? So I'm asking you. Right. If I select 500 of these 60-year-old females, what's the probability at least one dies? Here's where it gets really hard because at least one is one dies, or two dies, or three dies, because if three die, that's at least one, or four, or five, or, digit, or there's a probability that all 500 would die. So it's really crazy. So when you think about that, we're actually going to use the complement. So whenever you see a probability of at least, at least one, right, this is important, at least one, the opposite of it, or the complement, is that none die. So the probability at least one dies is equal to one minus the probability that none die. All right, that's the complement. So that's one minus the probability they all survive. All right, that's the same thing as none dying. Well, that's the first survives, and the second survives, and the third survives, and da 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 da, da all the way to and the 500 survives. Well, we know the probability that they survive. It's going to be 0 0.99186 times 0 0.99186 500 times. So that's just 0 0.99186 to the 500th power, which is just equal to that, believe it or not. So that's one minus this. Okay. So the final answer is 0 0.9832. So there's a very high probability, right, that at least one person of those 500 will die, which is sad. All right, given how high the probability is. All right, let's just do a quick rundown of the rules. All right, the probability of any event we know must be between 0 and 1. So if we let E to know any event, it's got to be between 0 and 1. So if you ever do a probability problem and get a probability that's negative or greater than 1, you'll know you made a mistake. 
All right, the sum of the probabilities of all outcomes in the sample space must be equal to one, right? Like when we were checking those tables, we had to make sure all the probabilities sum to one, right? You can see right here. All right, if E and F are disjoint events, meaning they can't happen at the same time, probability of E or F is equal to probability of E plus probability of F. If they are not disjoint, then the probability of E or F is equal to probability of E plus probability of F minus the probability of E or E and F. All right, if E represents any event and EC represents the complement of E, well, then we know the complement is just the probability of the complement happening is one minus the probability of the original event happening or the opposite happening, if that helps. If E and F are independent events, when I say what's the probability of E and F, you just multiply the two events together. All right. And you can expand on that if I say what's the probability of E and F and G and H, dot, 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 dot. You just multiply, multiply, multiply. All right. Two more rules to talk about in this lecture. So I want to talk about conditional probability. And then what I want to do is I want to talk about the general multiplication. All right. So we have two objectives here. All right. Talking about uh, computing additional probabilities. And then I want to talk about computing probabilities using the general multiplication. All right, so let's compute conditional probabilities first. The notation P, and then it looks like F with a line E, all right, this is read the probability of event F given, so I'm telling you or you know that event E occurs. <clears throat> so it is the probability that the event F occurs given that the event E has already occurred. So I'm telling you, find the probability of F knowing that E has already happened. All right, suppose that a single six-sided die is rolled. What is the probability that the die comes up as a four? Well, we know that that's one out of six, right? Because the four can only come up one way, and there's six outcomes. Now, suppose the die is rolled a second time. But we are told, as soon as you roll the dice, I cover it up, and I say, okay, hey, you just rolled an even number. So I'm giving you some piece of information. I'm telling you it was even, right? What is the probability then that the die comes up as a four? All right, well, the first roll here, you have these outcomes, right? So the probability that you rolled uh, a four is one out of six. The second roll, I'm telling you that it's an even number. So the ways that can happen is a two, four, six. So the probability then that you rolled a four, given that it was an even number, well, there's only three ways you can roll an even number. It's one out of three. So it just changed. So that's the whole point of conditional probability. I'm going to ask you a probability, but I'm going to tell you something happens. So under knowing that that second thing happened, what is the probability? All right, so there's a formula for it. So if E and F are any two events, then the probability that event F happens, given that event E occurs, is just equal to the probability of E and F happen. So the number of ways both these things can happen divided by the probability that E happens, right? Or the number, another way is the number of ways E and F can happen, divided by the number of ways E can happen, right? So the probability of event F occurring, given the occurrence of event E, is found by dividing the probability of E and F by the probability of E, or by dividing the number of outcomes in E and F by the number of outcomes in E. All right, let's do um, uh, a problem related to a survey that was taken. So a survey was conducted by the Gallup organization May 8th through 11th through 8th, in which 1,017 adults were asked the following. Which of the following statement comes closest to your belief about God? You believe in God, you don't believe in God, um, but you do believe in a universal spirit or higher power, or you don't believe in either. So there's four things. There. So the results of the survey by region, so I'm telling you the region of the country, are given in the table next. All right, so believe in God, believe in a universal spirit, don't believe in either. So these are the outcomes. So it's by the east, the midwest, the south, and the west, right? So what is the probability that a randomly selected adult American who lives in the east, so I'm telling you that they live in the east, so that's the piece of information I'm giving you. I'm asking that you believe in God. And then what is the probability that a randomly selected adult believes in God? So I'm telling you this and asking you to find the probability then that they live in the east. All right, so I want to first find the probability they believe in God, given that they live in the east. So it's the number of ways people can believe in God and live in the Northeast. Well, believe in God and live in the East 
That's just right here. It's 204. I have to divide that by the number of people who live in the east, right? Or all these numbers right here. So it looks like 204 divided by 204 plus 36 plus 15 gets me 0 0.8. So there's an 80% chance there. Pretty good. Now let's flip it. What's the probability they live in the east, given that they believe in God? So it's the number believe in God and live in the east right here, but divide by the number who believe in God. So divide by these numbers. So that's just 204 divided by the sum of these. So notice that the probability gets a lot smaller. It's just 0 0.26 here. So be careful what, what it's telling you or what it's giving you here so that you know which way to write this. All right, let's work another one. In 2005, 19.1% of all murder victims were between the ages of 20 and 24 years old. All right, so I'm giving you two pieces of information. They were a murder victim and their age. Also in 2005, 16.6% of all murder victims were 20 to 25 year old males. Okay, so now I'm telling you that they were murder victims, their age, and they were males. So what is the probability that a murder victim in 2005 was male, given that the victim was 20 to 24 years old? All right, so probably they're male, given that they were 20 to 24 years old. So that's equal to the probability they were male and 20 to 24 years old, which I have right here, right? This is 20 to 24 year old males divided by the probability that they were 20 to 24. Well, that's right here, right? Because that's the proportion that were 20 to 24 years old. So that's just equal to 0 0.166 divided by 0 0.191, which is roughly equal to this percentage when you plug that into your calculator. So just be careful how it's worded or to glean the information. <clears throat> Finally here, let's compute probabilities using the general multiplication rule. So the probability of two events, regardless if they're um, disjoint or not, so two events E and F both occur, so the probability that E and F both occur, you take the probability of the first event E, and then you would multiply that by the probability of the second event, given that the first event happened. So in words, the probability of E and F is the probability of E occurring times the probability of F occurring, given that I know the event E occurred. So let's go back to this problem, all right? So in 2005, 19.1% of all murder victims were between the ages of 20 and 24. Also, 86.9% of murder victims were male, given that the victim was 20 to 24 years old. That's what we found in the first problem. What is the probability that a randomly selected murder victim 2005 was a 20 to 24 year old male. So I want to find the probability the person was male and they were 20 to 24. So that's equal to the probability that they're 20 to 24 times the probability they were male given that they were 20 to 24. Well, this right here is just multiplied um, 0 0.869, okay, times 0 0.919. Multiply that, you just get that right there, which was the same thing we saw before. All right, class, I know this was a longer video, um, but it should cover um, all the basic rules for.